Hello, everyone. This is the Engineering Politics Podcast. Today is going to be a little different. You may have noticed this by just looking at the podcast length and seeing it's much longer than normal, but this is because instead of a usual overview of conservative thought and principles that I normally cover, I will instead be releasing a conversation between me and another creator talking about one of my favorite subjects, government, and how awful at everything government is. Well, I guess maybe that's an overstatement. That's not exactly my take on government as a whole, but we do unpack the popular talking point for most conservatives that we must reduce the size and scope of government. And although I certainly believe in this idea, it has become an empty talking point from the right because we always love to preach principles of self-government, but often give into the power of the government gun when it suits our interest or accomplishes what we want to accomplish. We, as conservatives, often forward the message of smaller government without answering the questions most people ask, which is, why must we reduce the size of government? What does government scope even mean? And what functions and obligations does government have that they can actually do right? My co-host and I go over these questions at length during our conversation. That brings me to my next point, which is the co-host himself. Today, I talked to a very skilled creator and commentator on politics and culture who goes under the name Return to Reason. Return to Reason, who also goes by the name Truman, is one of my favorite independent creators on the internet today. Although I don't believe he would categorize himself as a conservative, Truman and I hold the same core principles, which consists of free speech, honest debate, and individual liberty. We both agree that the public discourse at large today is divisive and full of bad faith attempts at attacking the opposition. The stated goal for Return to Reason is to bring common humanity and respect back to our public discourse, healing the ever-growing divide in our society. Aside from his very intelligent and insightful cultural and political commentary, I find him to be extraordinarily entertaining and highly recommend his impromptu videos because he does a great job at using pop culture references to explain how he's thinking through his ideas. You can find Return to Reason on YouTube under the name Return to Reason. You can also find him on Twitter at MyMundaneMind, as well as finding him on ThinkSpot under the profile name Return to Reason. And he also has his own locals community at ReturnToReason.Locals.com. If you like my content, I promise you, you will love Return to Reason. Before I move on to the conversation, I want to thank you for listening and reading my work. None of this would be happening if I didn't have the support of my listeners and the people who read the content on engineeringpolitics.com. But I want to make you all aware, if you aren't already, that I'm trying to build a community. In this community, you can get all of my content as soon as it's published, and you can talk directly to me and others in the community. My community can be found on engineeringpolitics.locals.com. You can become a member of this community by going to that address and creating a username and password. The great thing about this community is it's completely free. As of right now, I don't have anything behind a paywall. I'm more concerned about building a community than making money at this point. But there is an option to support my content if you're willing. You can become a subscriber starting at $2 per month. This subscription will get you a few more features and extra content, and will eventually unlock subscriber-only content in the future. I would ask that you consider supporting this content via the Engineering Politics Locals community, so this content can remain independent and pick up a larger following. I do plan on collaborating with other creators just like this in the future on this podcast, and the larger the following, the more creators will come on the podcast. I appreciate you sharing this content with others, and I hope you consider supporting if you aren't already. And if you are a member or supporter of the Engineering Politics Locals community, please consider joining the Return to Reason Locals community too. The only way we can build a community is by building it together. Well, that's it for now. Let's get the show started. You're listening to the Engineering Politics Podcast. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. Thanks for joining me. We're doing something a little different here. I feel like I say that at the beginning of everything. Uh... You know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. As you noticed, I'm still in my lovely bathroom recording studio. So I'm here with Kevin from Engineering Politics. Uh, Kevin has a pretty interesting podcast. 
they'll tell you about here in a minute. And uh, we're going to try some, just have a little bit of a conversation about some stuff. I told Kevin some stuff I thought would be interesting. He told me some stuff he, would, he thought would be interesting. And I said, all right, man, well, I'm pretty fried. Uh, dealer's choice. So uh, you can tell me, you know, kind of what you want to talk about. And we'll just, we'll go from there. And frankly, if this ends up being total garbage, this recording is never going to see the light of day. So who cares? But, uh, but that's kind of where we're at. And I'll let Kevin introduce himself here and tell you a little bit about his podcast. And then we will get started. Anyway, all right, Kevin, take it away, bud. Yeah, thanks, Truman. Uh, so my podcast called Engineering Politics really just goes over uh, conservative principles. But I try to do it because there's a billion different conservative uh, podcasters out there who are significantly better than I am. But what I want to do is represent a good way to uh, kind of explain and not really show off, but, you know, forward the principles of conservatism conservatism to people who aren't necessarily conservatives i want you know there not to be this big straw man that seems to be out there if you're going to listen to most media sources and you know the new york times and all these people will kind of paint conservatives as these kind of evil people who either just don't want times to change because they really take that conservative idea to conserve something to the extreme but i want to kind of show them that you know they're there is some real good ideas in conservatism and we should, you know, at least understand them. You don't have to agree with everything, of course. And, you know, I always try to, to do my best with giving the other side as much credit as I can. I try to never assume uh, malicious intent when I don't have to, you know, I'll, I'll go to the ignorance argument, but ignorance is not, it's not synonymous with stupid. Ignorance is just, I don't understand because I don't, I just haven't seen the other side. And I know I've done this a lot with progressivism and I want to make sure that, you know, people aren't going to do it with conservatism so the best I can. So I'm not perfect at it, but I think I know enough where I can write it down. Normally, my podcasts are going to go over a lot of the, my written content. Um, so, you know, it's it's stuff that's already been on paper, hopefully well thought out. Maybe some people commented on it and, and let me know where I'm wrong and where I can improve. So, you know, I try to do my podcast after those and then I'm creating some videos on it to try to to do a better just overall podcast experience and learning experience with everyone. So that's kind of what my site's about. Um, you know, we're, we're on locals.com. So that's kind of where I'm going to host my community of just different people who enjoy my content and want to talk more about it. Really, in the end, I kind of started doing this because huh, I want a better way to record my thoughts instead of just the comment section on Facebook with my friends, just, you know, bantering around and stuff like that. And, you know, my comments always tend to be like five pages long and I can tell no one read them and then no one responded. And it's like, you can win the argument if your comments is long enough. I've learned that on a lot of uh, social media, obviously Twitter is going to be limited, but if you can just make it long enough, people aren't going to read it and they're just going to stop because they don't want to keep the argument going. So uh, that isn't what I want to do. I don't want to win just debates. I actually wanted to have a good conversation and learn something from it. So I decided to take a lot of my thoughts and put them down on, on virtual paper, I guess, and, you know, kind of do it in a full article format. And through there, I love listening to podcasts. I know that when I, I used to at least travel a lot, um, we all did hopefully before this, but, uh, you know, I like it in podcast form, a good uh, verbal explanation I can listen to in the car. And, you know, that's kind of what I wanted to, to create that experience for other people. So that's where I come from. And, and uh, yeah, it's been, been a fun experience. It started around a year ago, but I kind of like writ, wrote a couple of pieces and then didn't get back to it for a while. And then the last couple of months, ever since the, the locals community thing started back up, you know, I've been able to focus a lot more on, on more content. So it's been fun. That's awesome, man. You know, one thing I will say before we launch into the, the meat of it is that the, it's a revelation. It's the first I've ever heard that Facebook is not the best place to have a productive conversation. So I, I, I have to completely change my paradigm now. Um, and I've been a MySpace guy. I thought that was a bit of yeah, don't, don't get on. Tw don't talk to me about Twitter, though, because if you tell me that both Facebook and Twitter are primed for counterproductive and divisive and vitriolic conversations, I think my whole worldview would collapse uh, because that's that's kind of the, the truth that I uh, build everything around. Um, anyway, okay, so well, what are you drinking there? First off, what do you got? I got Black Rifle Coffee. They're not a sponsor of the show, but okay. maybe one day. Um, what grind? I don't even remember what grind it is. I'm not like a, a coffee connoisseur, but I do the small batch. Stuff. Yeah, all right. Yeah, cool. it's, it's, it's like almost time for whiskey. Very close. Yeah, I was going to say, I've got uh, some some cheap whiskey and cranberry juice here and a little bit of lemon. So we should probably probably handle some of the, the deeper stuff on the front end because the more of that I have, the less my ability is to – not that it's a, I started a very high place of 
ability to answer questions. Yeah, we try. But if you start at a low place and then you go even lower, then it's it's just utter garbage. So cool. All right, you got your coffee. Kevin, what are we talking about, man? Hit me with it. Yeah, so I think something we discussed a little bit before the show uh, and is an interesting topic that's that's on its face. You can always say we want to limit the scope of government. You know, that is the the bumper sticker on my car. That is everything I shout at on Twitter, Facebook, all that stuff. That is a, a main conservative talking point. But it really becomes a talking point when we decide not to explain it at all. And we just say limit the scope and limit the size of government. And, you know, that does scare some people. And in, in my effort to try and explain the principles of conservatism, you can't just say, I want to minimize the size. So when people who view government as helping people, you know, if that's their job in their mind to help people, I, I want this entity that some believe is, a, is an efficient tool to help people, and I want to minimize it. And that to them is just hearing, oh, this guy just wants to not help poor people and doesn't want equal rights for everyone and doesn't want all these protections they believe the government is supposed to give us. So instead of just saying limit the scope, maybe we should define what ought the government do. You know, what is their job? What uh, value can they provide? Can they provide it better than, let's say, an alternative, a free market? You know, what can they do? What are they good at doing? And maybe even a little bit, you know, what do the founders intend them to do? I know we always say, you know, back in the founders and, you know, they're all perfect people, apparently. Um, which, you know, it will get thrown back in your face when some of these founders, you know, fell short of, I think, the American experiment that they originally set in place. So to define that job, I guess, define what does that scope look like? And then how do we do all of those activities in that scope efficiently, competently, and, you know, move it forward without just wasting a bunch of tax dollars and having these, you know, these obligations of the government be used as a political tool rather than an actual, you know, source of good, which it's obviously its intended purpose is supposed to be. So that's so, something I'd love to talk about. So, so the question that I, I just wrote down <clears throat> is that whenever we talk about, and, I, and I'm, I'm with you whenever it comes to, you know, whenever we say scope, really we're just talking about what is the government doing, right? So the question is, you know, like you said, a lot of people hear it as, I don't want x thing to be done as opposed to i don't think the government is best at doing this thing in other words it's i want this to be done i just don't think that the, the, it's the job of the government to do it but before we get into that whenever we talk about limiting the scope let's let's tease out first a little bit the question of why why would you want to limit the scope of government in the first place i have like a a little bit of a thought, like a, a metaphor in my head, but I want to I want to hear your thoughts on that first. Like why would we want to do that in the first place? Yeah. So to me, and it's always easiest, I guess, for for most conservatives, this is the the easiest way to explain things. Is always what's what's the alternative? What what would take its place if the government was no longer allowed? If it was not in the government scope to do this thing? And a lot of times the answer is a free market economy or capitalism is a lot of people like to refer to it. I normally refer to it as a free market because it, it describes the behavior of people in that marketplace. So if the free market can give us these things much more efficiently, effectively at a lower cost than a centralized entity like the government can, it doesn't make sense not to do it that way. And you know, when you when you have a centralized government, you know, we, we like to, uh, I would say us conservatives are the people who want to limit the scope, always use that centralized power and they use terms like the government gun, you know, this, this forceful language to kind of show how, you know, evil this centralized power can be. I'm not trying to say all government is bad or government is evil. I actually think most of the government is made up of good people who do want the best for the people. They just don't know how to do it. Or I use the word ignorance, you know, they're ignorant of how you know, a more efficient, effective way can be. And they try to use and implement these things like, you know, the war on poverty that is supposed to result in less poverty that actually really resulted in more poverty and more dependence on the state. You know, when we can use alternatives or alternatives to me, the alternative is the government. The, the real solution is, you know, most of the time some sort of free market solution. So let's say, you know, um, trying to help poor people out of poverty. We know for a fact that the free market has pulled more people out of poverty worldwide than any centralized power or government program ever has. So the argument that we keep pushing against that, because we're kind of scared. I mean, I think it's the security blanket that a centralized power can give you that makes people say, I would rather feel secure that, you know, I have this big 
body of, you know, pooled taxpayer money to help back me rather than, you know, I'm dependent on this market. I know markets can crash. I know markets can, can go down. It really depends on a lot on the consumer and other worldwide activities, especially when it's an international market. And it's that trade for security. You know, we're, we're trying to get rid of a little bit of a liberty. You can put it in terms of accountability. You know, I, I know I don't want to blame people or say no one wants to be held accountable. But in reality, you know, your well-being is your responsibility. When you start to push it off or believe it's on someone else's responsibility, you know, who does that? Our children do that. And we don't want to be treated as children by the government. You know, we're taxpayers. We, we do pay into the system. We want to make sure that, you know, we can benefit from it. And the reliance and the centralized power kind of is that parent to us. You know, that's kind of the vision we're, we're beginning to see. You know, I think it started, you know, probably, I mean, it started a while ago, but you can always kind of give the origins in the 60s where you have large government programs. Again, the war on poverty started then. It's just that belief system that this is the way we ought to do it. And, and to, to be fair to them, a lot of the world does it this way. But sometimes it's better to be unique. You know, we, we say America is so much different than everyone else. Why aren't we the same? Well, America's pretty good at a lot of things. Maybe we should remain unique. Um, but, you know, getting away from that thinking that I need the centralized power to to make my life better rather than allowing me to make my life better. And that's something great a free market does. So that's why I would like to limit a lot of the scope and abilities that the, the uh, government can do and, and can uh, or I would say things they can help the people with rather than allowing them and giving them the best ability to help themselves, I think is the important part. Sure. Yeah. The, that there's a lot there. So I, whenever you said the people want the, that warmth, you know, being wrapped around them, I thought about in the movie gangs in New York, it's a great movie. And uh, Leonardo DiCaprio is, you know, he's starts working for this mob boss guy who killed his dad and he wants, he's basically wants to kill him. And he starts kind of realize that he's, you know, starting to really kind of care about this guy. And one of the things he says in one of the voiceovers is, is that's the thing about sleeping beneath the wing of a dragon. It's a lot warmer than you'd think. And so I think that, you know, that's that perspective is at least somewhat analogous to how people can view the government. You know, they don't realize necessarily that it's a dragon, um, but I would say it's a dragon with an IQ of about 12, but we can get there here in a minute. The, uh, I like what you said about the government is the alternative. And the thought that I had, um, you know, when you mentioned the free market and stuff and why we would want to limit the scope, I was thinking about, you know, if I was the foreman on a construction site and I had a bunch of different crews in working and I, I'm like, I need this area dug out because this is where we're going to put the foundation, whatever, we're digging this out, we're going to lay these lines. And there is dudes from all these different crews with, you know, shovels in there moving around. And a couple of them were just total morons. They are dropping their everything. Like it's like a slapstick movie, you know, like, or, or, you know, the Swedish chef kind of thing. <laughs> like I would want to limit the scope of people in that trench digging it out. I would want there to be fewer people there doing it. Particularly, I would want to limit the scope of the responsibility of that really bad crew. I wouldn't want them working on that. It's like, maybe you guys are good over here. Maybe you're not so good at digging holes, but you're really good at pouring concrete. Like, I'm going to send you over there and do that. I want to limit the scope of what this one crew is doing because they're not very good at this one thing and there are other people that could fill that. So, you know, that's what the thing that came to my mind is like limiting scope just means I want people to focus on what they're good at. I want, you know, the government to do what it's good at. And sometimes you don't know until you try, in all fairness. You might not know until you try. But the reason the the saying, you don't reinvent the wheel, like that exists for a reason. If someone's really, really good at something, just, you know, spending uh, inordinate amounts of money to see if you might be 2% better is a little bit silly in my mind. Um, so, okay. So we want to, we do care about the things. It's just, we want, and it's because, it's because we care, if I'm hearing you right, it's because we care that we want to make sure they get done as efficiently as possible. We want to make sure that they are done in a way like the way I think about it is, uh, have, have you read the book, The Tragedy of American Compassion? No. It's a really good book about uh, like old school entitlement programs. Like it's about charities really and, and the history of charities in the country. And one of the things they found was that like back in the 1800s, there were all these private charities and then there started to be like government run soup kitchens and stuff that opened up and the private run ones had stipulations on what you had to do in order to 
to be there. Like you had to be working, you had to be doing the stuff. They used the term deserving and undeserving poor, which I think probably was fine then, but now you, you couldn't say that. Um, but you know, you get the, you get the idea, like, Mm. The undeserving poor would be someone who was just there to eat your food and not try to get out of their situation. All right. Mm. And so they were saying like, look, if you're going to do this, like you can't be here, we're here to help you. We're not here to like be your permanent caretaker, but the government run soup kitchens and stuff didn't have any of those stipulations. And so if you're a person who is, you know, destitute and you can go and get some soup for free, or you can go and get some soup for work and stuff, well, most times you're going to go and get the one for free. And so the private ones closed down. And even though they were helping people get out of that situation and the government run ones like had to expand because the amount of people that were in need grew because the private ones were closing down. And then it's just the government run ones doing it, but they're not, those didn't have the same stipulations. So they weren't helping people get out of their, their situation and the same like the data even today on the dollars that are spent on charities versus government is about mm -hmm. an inverse ratio it's about a I think it's between 10 and 30 percent of a dollar that is in a government bureaucracy is actually spent on the cause and the rest is spent on the bureaucracy and it's between I think 90 and 70 percent in a private charity of that dollar that actually goes to the cause and then 10 to 30 goes to sustaining because they're incentivized to be as uh, financially efficient as possible, but that's a whole other thing. Okay, so we're thinking about, so we, we just want to kind of uh, dust some of this stuff off a little bit and be very clear in what we're saying. So we're not saying we don't think there aren't things that aren't important, right? We're saying that this mm -hmm. is about making sure that it gets done as efficiently as possible because it's important, because it's important. Um, okay, so let's talk about how we would consider like Whenever you think about the scope of government in terms of what it does, what do you think are some of the parameters that we would use to consider that? I have my own thoughts that I've told you, but I want to hear mm -hmm. what you think. What, what parameters yeah. should we use for thinking about that? Yeah, so, you know, a lot of people like to refer, or people, I'd say conservatives again, um, would refer to the, the concept of positive and negative rights. You know, negative rights is really the, that's uh, another word I would say for liberty. You know, it's what you're protecting people from. You're not giving them anything. You're not giving them a good or service. You're protecting them from something. So, you know, negative right is your rights to, to life. Basically, you know, you can't, you can't, it's illegal to murder, right? You know, you cannot, the, your liberty to murder someone else is not a liberty that extends that far because of someone else's liberty to live, right? So they want to protect that. That's a negative right. When we start getting into positive rights, you're now talking about goods and services and, and different actions they can take to provide you something. So there, there are some like small instances of positive rights. You know, it's kind of a, a lot of people refer to your, your rights to, to have a lawyer. Basically, you know, when you, you're too poor, can't afford a lawyer, you can always take a public one, you know, public defense. Um, although that there, there are ways kind of around that to really say that is a negative right. Not, not as much of a positive right, but when we start getting into these positive rights and we start to give, you know, a good thing is, you know, when we start to give this government charity and this idea that, you know, happens a lot, I'll refer to them as the left. I don't like to, to normally use these broad terms like Democrats and Republicans. I'm going to say people who are more left-leaning, the progressives, would argue, you know, that we, we can use government resources to help, you know, the hungry. You know, you can have a, a public soup kitchen might help. but what the what you were speaking of with the the private soup kitchen would be to incentivize certain behaviors you know what what outcome are you looking for are you looking to solve poverty or are you looking to change the behavior that leads to poverty you know when you try to solve something that just means you can throw i can i can solve a lot of things i can do my child's homework that gets their homework done problem solved but mm. does that help them at all because the intention of homework is not to to do it and just get it done or hopefully not. And, you know, you see bad teachers that'll do busy work and, and normally you refer to them as bad teachers, right? The, what, what they're trying to do is incentivize this behavior to work hard on a specific problem or learn whatever they need to. So that is, you know, their responsibility to make sure that they change their behavior or, you know, create a, just a, a better behavior that helps them learn more in the future. Right. So, um, yeah, when we talk about what, what government really ought to do, it is to protect the individual. You know, we can't, you can't have other people trying to harm other people and take away their rights and liberties. So, you know, there's a protection there. Also to protect basically the nation state, you know, you have your, your national defense that 
um, just make sure that they, they look out for the interests of you, but it's not internal. You know, you don't use the army to, to solve internal problems state to state, or you shouldn't. Um, it's always, you know, pointed outward. So that's an important, I would say, obligation of the federal government uh, to do those things. Um, you know, border security is something that I would, I would throw in there because it, again, is protecting, you know, the citizens who are, who have kind of paid into the system and, you know, make sure that they can have their liberties protected, you know, under, under the law. So, um, yeah, a lot of, a lot of these outward things protecting us from, from, you know, exterior actors, I guess, is something that the, the federal government should be doing. And then really that's a majority of what they should be doing. You know, there's a lot of things that they do like social security that really, you know, it was a great idea to start out with, but, you know, it kind of seemed like you're just kicking the buck down the road rather than solving the problem you said to solve. So, you know, that's something that really turned into a positive, right? And now we're starting to see that in was like 30 to 35 years, that, that well will be dry. And, you know, I'm not probably going to benefit anything from that, which is, you know, if you start cutting it off or starting tearing it back, because obviously there's people who paid into it already, you got to give them some sort of benefit. You know, to me, it's like if you start cutting it off and I don't receive any, but that doesn't mean that I don't have to keep paying into it then I'm totally fine with it and I'm willing to, to give that up. But, you know, that's not really something that's supposed to fit in the scope of government. So to, to go back and answer your question in a long roundabout way, it is to, it, the federal government is meant to protect the liberty. It is not meant to give you things, not meant to give you all these positive rights. Not, it's not a service. You know, we have the free market. Those provide goods and services. The, the federal government is supposed to protect you from, you know, each other sometimes, you know, when it comes to obviously, you know, crime and stuff like that. Um, but it is meant to be more of a, a protector from uh, people trying to intrude on your liberty more so than try to provide things for you. You know, liberty doesn't really fit into the uh, I'm going to give you a good or service. That's not really what liberty is. And we try to kind of fit that in there and say, well, if you're too poor, then you can't do these things and you can't live your life. And, you know, that's not liberty. That's that's not what not within the scope of liberty. You're supposed to be able to provide for yourself, but be able to provide for yourself. If you find yourself you can't provide for yourself because someone's shutting you down, someone's locking you in. You know, if we're forced to stay at home and you can't provide for your family, we're starting to see an intrusion on liberty. And that's not. No, I mean, this is all theoretical, just, you know, obviously. Um, so yeah, you know, that's, that's my idea and, and the original founding idea of the federal government is to protect liberty. So I wrote down a different question, but I, one that I thought of that I like a little better based on what you just said is, okay, so what would you say to someone who said, um, because the, the, the argument true or not of this wasn't the purpose of federal government is only meaningful to someone who cares about what the original purpose was, right? So what would you say to someone who said, yeah, that doesn't matter to me. It's not about what that purpose was. I'm talking about right here, right now. And if they could do something to make a positive impact on people right here, right now, do you have a better answer than, well, they're just not supposed to? You know what I mean? So what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, no one's obligated to believe the founding principles of the founders of the people who, you know, created this government in the way it is. But normally for a lot of these things, it's like, again, are, are you thinking about the government as the solution or the alternative solution? You know, a lot of those questions you can kind of go back into and say, well, what, what what's the, the solution for this? You know, again, with, with poverty, what what is the solution to solve this behavior? that leads to poverty. It's not poverty itself you're just trying to solve. That's easy. You just throw money at it. You'll solve it. If you try to change the behavior that leads people out of poverty, you know, what's going to come from that? I mean, you can't really make government jobs. You can't do a lot of these things because, again, that's just stuff given to people. You need to be able to find a way to incentivize that change. So normally the free market solution, which is not the alternative to me, it would be the original solution, which all solutions have trade-offs. No really such thing as a solution. There's always a trade-off to something, but that goes with federal solutions as well. You know, you, you have to find what is the, the actual solution to this thing. What would you do um, to make your life better and assuming nothing was just given to you by the central entity? And when you think about it in those terms, you'll normally find some sort of free market uh, you know, incentive, service, good that you can benefit from. And if you benefit from from something, normally you pay into it, the people producing that service or good would benefit from it as well. So now there's this mutual back and forth instead of making it a centralized government sort of answer, 
which can benefit the politicians politically, maybe. But, you know, the benefit only goes so far. And then the only incentive to government officials who who provide that, what I would say, alternative solution is to throw more money at it normally instead of making it more efficient and uh, work better for you. It's just that uh, I'm going to keep building this program and now you can pay a bunch of people to do administrative work in that program. And that's why you get 30 percent of every you know, kind of donated sum that goes to the government actually go to that solution. You know, a lot of it's a bureaucracy and by bureaucracy, it's, it's a lot of just administrative work. There's, you know, bosses of people who are bosses of other people who now got to distribute this thing out and it just gets, that dollar gets less and less efficient the more you do that. You got to get those cover letters on the TPS reports, man, if you don't. Yeah, right. well, exactly. Yeah. I'll get that. So mm -hmm. what would you say, um, again, I write stuff down and then I'm ignoring it, but what would you say to, um, so there, one thing that I, that is just kind of empirically true is that things don't happen in a vacuum. Um, so for example, there's a really fantastic barbecue place, Kansas City, Missouri, actually it's in Kansas City, Kansas, but I like to say Missouri because I like it better. Mm -hmm. Um, called, it was called Oklahoma Joe's, now it's Joe's Casey. It's one of the best barbecue places in the world. It was on Anthony Bourdain's list of 13 places to eat on planet earth before you die. Uh, nice. It's fantastic. So I would not go and open a barbecue place right next to Joe's Casey. I wouldn't do that. That would be really stupid. But if there was no barbecue place within miles, I could feel okay opening a barbecue place there. So the point is, is that people could argue, well, the government doesn't just start doing stuff if there isn't a need. So they're, if they're addressing a need and they could be addressing it well, they could be addressing it poorly, but if there was no need, there'd be no argument or impetus to, you know, create this program in the first place. So clearly that shows there's some uh, insufficiency on the part of the, the private market because there wouldn't, there wouldn't be that need if it was being taken care of so super well by, our, by the free market. So mm -hmm. what would you say to someone who said, well, the government's only doing it because it needs to be done? Mm -hmm. Like, and it's not so Basically, every example of that, you can always find some sort of origin as to why it's not being there. You got to remember that, uh, you know, the free market is based on incentives. If there's no incentive to do something, then, you know, obviously no one's going to do it. You know, if there's no incentive to create a barbecue place next to this amazing barbecue place, why would I do it? But a lot of times, and if you're saying that there is some sort of need for a supply, but there's no supply, most likely it's not the free market just ignoring, uh, ignoring that need. There is something there from saying, you know, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur and I'm like, I get into that business, but there's something not incentivizing me. And if this needs so high, it's obviously not the need for the product. It's something else. And normally when you get to the origins of that, that conflict there, there's something using a centralized power to stop you or disincentivize you from doing such a thing. So a lot of these have, you know, either the regulation to get into that industry is too high or, you know, some other bureaucratic or state nonsense that will create a barrier from you creating your free market marketplace in that area. So normally the government solution to that always is, you know, we, we can manufacture need if we, if we just, you know, regulate the, the marketplace and not really allow or this not allow for an incentive to build something in that marketplace. Then you, you get to the origins of that and say, maybe instead of using tax dollars to to create a, a supply for this need, let's see what we can do to incentivize other people. Again, you're changing behavior rather than just creating the solution out of thin air and maybe not changing the behavior, just creating a solution for solution's sake. So I think a lot of those instances, it's just there's a barrier to entry in that marketplace that can be changed. Because if there's, if there's a need for something, there, there's no supplier if they can just freely supply that need. There's no one who's not going to do it. You know, there's, there's someone who's going to jump in there because there is something to benefit from jumping into that market. So it depends on the situation, I guess. But normally, you're not going to see, see uh, some barrier or no want to supply that need, I guess, is the best sure. way to put it. Yeah. I, think, I think we probably, I think we agree on the answers here. But I, I think, well, I would, t I agree with, the, or I guess the conclusion of what you're saying in some ways. But what I would add maybe to it, I don't even think this is a good disagreement, but the thought that came to my mind, so we're talking about changing behavior, right? So yeah. 
whenever like the campaign, the truth campaign about, you know, smoking and stuff started, we saw teen smoking decrease precipitously. You know, I think it was in the seventies, maybe that the tobacco industry finally admitted that cigarettes were harmful. Doctor people finally said cigarettes were harmful. Um, and so, and when we also have lots of places that, uh, are, are free to people who want to deal with addiction, right? So we're talking, so mm -hmm. what, why do I bring that up? The reason I bring that up is because we're talking about changing human behavior. I think one of the problems, and maybe you could call it a tough pill to swallow in a lot of ways, is that at some, on some level, you will never get 100% of the population to do a certain thing to do what's in their best interest, to do, um, and that's what, you know, freedom comes at those costs, right? Being free mm -hmm. means free to just persistently F up. Free uh, to fail, yeah. And so uh, part of it, I, you know, I think is a, is a problem. I agree with you that regulations are an issue. I agree with you that government bureaucracy is a giant tumor roadblock in the way of progress quite often, but there's another level where, you know, when we talk about supply and demand, it's not necessarily that the supply in some of these areas is a bunch of people going, I want to be out of poverty, right? The demand is a bunch of yeah. people, I want to be out of poverty. You know, it, it, it might just be people who fall into that category. And some of them are like, dude, this sucks. I want to be out of poverty. But statistically, most people that want to leave it do, right? They do. Um, mm -hmm. And so I don't want to get too much in the weeds on that one issue, but the, the point is, is that there's another group that will just, just some, they're just people that make bad decisions sometimes. And so the question is, is how do we make it as easy as possible for the people who truly want to get out of their situation, to get out of their situation as quickly as possible? We want to make it easy for them to find a way to get out and as quick as possible for them to GTFO, get out of there. And at the same time, while not rewarding the people who are, who are not interested in that. You know, I, I tell this story whenever I think mm -hmm. about poverty, homelessness, because I think it kind of encapsulates this. I told it in one of my previous podcasts, but I used to pick up hitchhikers. Every time I had an opportunity, I'd pick up hitchhikers. Whenever I was in high school, some friends, I was driving, some friends talked me into stopping to, and I thought we were gonna pick this guy up, and then uh, we were just dicks to him, and I guess, and then we drove away. And so I felt so bad about that. I'm like, I'm always gonna pick up a hitchhiker every time I have a chance. And so I did that for years, you know, until my wife was like, Hey, uh, this is scary. Let's not do this anymore. I'm like, okay, fair enough. Mm -hmm. But uh, one time I picked up these two, uh, these two folks, took them about 45 minutes. They had, it was a guy and a girl. They had a, a dog with them. And these guys were like real deal. Like this is what you think of when you think of like a hobo transient, like they had legitimate like patchwork clothing that was like, this one's denim. This one is kind of leather. This one is regular <laughs> fabric. Like actually, like really, really. Yeah. Um, they look like what it reminded me of is uh, those, you know, those like coloring books, those like precious moments kids, but there's like little hobo kids and they have patchwork <laughs> clothing, which is kind of morbid. I don't know who, you know, whenever I thought about, I'm like, oh, it kind of reminds me of that. And then I had the afterthought was like, why the f were there hobo kid coloring books? That's so that illustrator Bernie Sanders. Exactly. Right. Exactly. <laughs> um, so I'm like, this is morbid. Who's like, you know, I've exhausted everything. Let's do kids doing meth. You know, I don't know. Anyway, but they had these patchwork and they had a, like this Mountain Dew Code Red bottle. They were passing back and forth. It turned out had a bunch of Everclear in it and they were just getting hammered. And, you know, she has like a knife on her hip and so does he. And I was like kind of intimidated by that. But also I'm like, I respect this. We're cool. You know, like, and they were telling me their stories of being out on the road. She was talking about how he was her road dog, which means that's the guy that, you know, protects you. I don't know what she is to him. And they were talking about Machete Mike and these different encounters in different places and how this is just what they like to do. And that's fine. Like what I said the, in the, it was a long time ago, but the video where I talked about, I'm like, that's fine if that's what they want to do, but I want to pay zero cents into them doing that. I don't want that to have any impact on me. And whenever Bernie Sanders talks about giving everyone a house, I'm like, you want to give these guys a house? Are you kidding me? I want a house. I should have a house before the road dog and his, you know, <laughs> road queen, I don't know, whatever, are out there getting a the house. That's crazy. And so my point is, is obviously that's not every person who's homeless, but it's obviously at least some people who are homeless. And so the point is, is that, you know, we talk about if 
I don't think that the market analogy is a perfect analogy because demand implies demand. They were not demanding to be like, you know what, if only I could just get a job at a bank. You know, I just really want to settle down and quit doing meth on the road. You know what I mean? Like, that's not, they, they didn't have that demand. So they were in the category of people that would be in the demand side of whatever we think about it because they would qualify, right? But they're not actually demanding it. So the question is, is how do we, you know, kind of delineate, how do we step between those who are just demographically here and those who are demographically here but really don't want to be here? And it's a difficult, it's, you know, I've found that nuance is the enemy of government policy or any type of discussions about anything. But nuance is kind of what's required there, as with anything. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of the thought that I had. Mm. Whenever you're talking about the, the, the market and the supply and the demand, I agree. Um, but there's a whole other issue baked into that, which is the demand isn't necessarily representative of the demand. Like, in right. other words, you're never going to get 100% because there are some people that aren't interested in, yeah. in, not, in not doing that, yeah. which is fine. That's, that's mm. part of – I don't want to do that, but that's part of you know, the – being a, you know, in a free country. Right. And, and that, and that I think is the behavior side of it, right? They're right. going to be very high demand for private jets. I would love a private jet. That does not mean that that demand is going to have an automatic supply of something, an, an affordable private jet, right? right? Or they become more affordable, but it doesn't manifest in reality. Yep. So that is a behavior that I'm talking about, you know, you know, um, that if, if I want something, like if, if, uh, uh, you know, these, these people, these, this gentleman, gentleman and gentle lady you picked up, uh, wanted a house, you know, but they're sitting there drinking their code red and, you know, not doing anything. Hopefully that changes their behavior to once, you know, click and say, Hey, maybe I should actually do something and I can get myself a house rather than just being given one or waiting, yeah. wait to be given one. And I actually think, you know, the government programs incentivize that behavior, the behavior they have, you know, yeah. I expect to just be given cause I'm here. Right. So normally when I talk about free market and, and it's easy to describe free market as just an exchange of goods and services for monetary capital. That's not all that a free market is. It does extend to ideas. You know, you can, you can widen it out to just be a trade of social capital. You know, you, you're gaining social capital. You believe maybe, well, maybe I'm not trying to assume your, your, your uh, intentions of picking up hitchhikers, but in a way you're kind of trading social capital with yourself, like saying, I, I don't want to be the guy that just leaves them go and when they need help, let me pick them up. And then, you know, maybe you can get, you know, social capital in the form of good karma or what, you know, whatever you I believe. I forgot to add that I usually uh, yeah. murdered them uh, at the end yeah. of the trip. I, well, I, I, one assumes that guy just went, I just assume right. that. I mean, you're still here. So obviously, yeah. Um, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we need to kind of extend because I call it a free market, not capitalism because free market describes this behavior and that behavior is not, just about money it is about the free exchange of something you know i want to free exchange ideas i want to give a free exchange of this when you say i i want a house i want a jet and i'm not going to work for it it's not a free exchange of anything it's a demand right? right and that sort of demand can definitely be supplied by centralized power of the government it doesn't come for free it comes from the taxpayers and there's always a cost for these things but you know when we when we talk about demand you want to to incentivize a specific behavior to fulfill that demand. You know, in a free market, we're all producers and consumers. We have to, to produce something in order to consume something. And when we fall outside of that behavior in something that I would call a fixed market or can be referred to as socialism or, you know, all, all kinds of names, when you fix a market, you now really don't care about the demand. You just kind of assume there's unlimited production of something. And when someone, when the wants and needs come out rather than just the demand and, and being able to pay for that demand, now a fixed market can accomplish that. But in the end, you're going to get poor behavior as a result. You know, I'm not going to try to work for anything that I'm getting because I'm just being given it. Why would I work for it? And also, you know, that the production value, you're not incentivizing new producers to come out there. So you're not incentivizing this entrepreneurship and, and you know, people's ability to create something on their own and start to innovate. You know, the, the strongest part of, of the free market, and I'm not just talking about, again, um, just monetary capital, but ideas is now I have an incentive to innovate ideas. I have an incentive to come out with better ideas, right? Hopefully that's kind of what the founders thought when they started to kind of create this, this uh, you know, new system, this kind of democratic republic where, you know, the government is beholden by the people. You're not going to disarm the people because when they, you know, they're the real bosses. When they tell you, you got to make a change, you got to make a change. You can't, there's going to be no tyranny allowed in the system. You know, hopefully that was 
uh, a learned idea. You know, we all think that we're just born with freedom or freedom in our minds or the, the, the wants for freedom. That's not really the human condition. If you read pieces or, you know, literature like the Gulag Archipelago, you learn real quick that freedom is not just inherent. It's not the default in the human brain. It is a probably one of the best inventions of the human mind of all time. It's that free market of ideas that eventually sprang out. And, you know, there's a certain tipping point where now like freedom's now, now the default in our brains. We all want freedom except for, you know, in some countries it's not always the default. Um, but that free market incentive is, is what allows us to, to change our behavior to benefit society most. And we always talk about benefiting the individual that does, cause we are social creatures benefiting of the individual will eventually spring out to benefiting society. You know, that's the behavior we want to change. And if we, again, just fulfill needs and fulfill these blind demands for things, we're going to be incentivizing the wrong behavior. And that's kind of, you know, it's, it's a long, non-tangible way of understanding government and maybe doesn't help everyone and takes a long time to explain. But that should be kind of the starting point of our ideas. You know, what behaviors are we incentivizing? How can we help people help themselves? Totally. Totally. I agree. I will say, I do think that there are probably certain people I don't think freedom is something I'm going to put a pin. I just, this is, I don't think freedom is something that just manifested into the, the collective consciousness. I think that there probably have always been people who valued freedom, just like there are probably always people who've been exploitative. There are always been people who are altruistic. There have always been people who are selfish, always been people who are generous. So I think freedom, there have always been people who valued freedom. The question is, is that, do the maximum amount of people have access to the thing that they value? So I think that we've, we're in an era where the, the people have access to freedom on a larger scale than they ever have. But I think there's been people that have valued freedom for, you know, millennia. It, mm -hmm. they, they just couldn't necessarily get it depending on who they were, but that's, that's a whole nother thing. So one thing I did have a thought about the rights portion, and then I'd like to kind of transition to something a little bit more specific, but We'll say whenever it comes to rights, we do, we do give up our rights temporarily in lots of exchanges, right? So I thought mm -hmm. about when I get on a roller coaster, I consent to be strapped in to that roller coaster. And halfway through the roller coaster, I couldn't just get up and get out, right? And it'd be yeah. stupid if I did. But I consent to, you know, to do that. Same if I get on an airplane. Like I've now, for the duration of that flight suspended my own freedom to go somewhere different or to associate with different people because I've, I've agreed to that. You know, if I go to and I get surgery and they have to put me under for anesthesia, I've given up my freedom to autonomy, at least for the time being that while I'm on anesthesia, because I'm trading that freedom for something better in that moment. Mm -hmm. Right. So mm -hmm. I'm, I don't think that every exchange, a, a temporary exchange of freedom is necessarily falls under the rubric of that Benjamin Franklin quote. Um, mm. I think they probably most do, but they're at least whenever we talk about implementing policy as opposed to individual exchanges of goods and services. Mm. But I think it'd be a mistake to say that there's no such thing as an exchange of freedom temporarily that hasn't been thought through. We do that every single day, every single day. Mm. Same with, I mean, I have a job, right? So if I consent to go, work at work at the job whenever we're not in you know during the apocalypse like after the apocalypse is over right so after i you know i'm working eventually at, at the job and i say hey look i'm gonna be here i've given up my freedom to I have to be in this building or i have to be here now i could choose my freedom over that arrangement and leave but now i've given up the job so like we we do that kind of calculus all the time um so i, I just think that's an important distinction to make but let's going back to the scope and the, of how do we figure out what the government ought to be doing, right? So kind of the way that I've thought about this, and I've told you this uh, prior to me recording this, but is, you know, I think about, like, if we, if we agree that there are certain things that need to be done, like the, the government's doing something, and we agree, like, yeah, that's a good thing. That does need to happen. I agree. Um, if we're talking about providing services to families, who need a little help temporarily if we're talking about people who might uh, be financially destitute and might need some help with uh, their health health care or, or something like that. Um, we can agree that there are things that the government does that we think are good things to, to be doing, right? Mm -hmm. And so the question is, is how do we decide if the government's the right candidate for that job? And so the, 
the metaphor that I told you before was, you know, we talk about what is the government's job. We're using the term scope here. And really, you could probably interchange that with job because um, really it's just like, what should they be doing and what should they not be doing? Um, mm -hmm. And so, But a lot of people talk about, well, it's not the government's job to do that or it is the government's job to do that. And one of the things that I mentioned to you was, well, we don't actually, when we use that word job, we don't use it the same way we use job in virtually any other context because the way we use the word job in other contexts, someone says, what's your job? You say, oh, I get paid to do this. I went through this hiring process. My employer chose me over other applicants, typically. And there's a reason why they chose me, because they thought that I would add the most value to their business over the other applicants. I would have the highest degree of competency, or I would at least be the, you know, the, most, the best fit for the job, right? Whenever we talk about the government's job, we don't think about it in that same competitive, kind of wide-reaching framework mentally. We just think about it in terms of doing the thing. Like, is it the government's job to do this? We're, whenever we use it in that context, we're talking about, should this thing be done? And so not, should it be done? And should there be a selection process for the best candidate for that job? And so there's mm -hmm. a lot of things, I think that we make that mental switch. I can't remember what uh, Daniel Kahneman talks about it in Thinking Fast and Slow. And I think Nassim Taleb also writes about it in Black Swan, but how, I think it's called domain dependence, where a, a doctor will prescribe you a antibiotics or something for a mild disease. Yeah, it's, it's domain dependence for a mild disease, but then they'll also say you should be exercising in order to boost your immune system. And he's saying, well, you probably don't need antibiotics in some of these instances so that you can strengthen your immune system, but they also want you to do the exact opposite, which is to go and, and, and push your body to the limits so that it gets stronger. So their doctor is showing domain dependence when they say, we don't want your body to be pushed here, so I'm gonna give you antibiotics and make it easy for you, but I do want your body to be pushed here because it'll be good for you in the long run. So domain dependence is where you take the same principle, but you, don't, you apply it here, but you don't apply it here. And so I think we do that whenever we talk about what the government's job is or isn't, is it, it's a domain dependence thing. The way we think about it with the government's job is way different than we think about any other thing. So my question, uh, if, if you're cool with this, is uh, to try to transition to thinking about, okay, if you were going to hire someone, and we can do specifics here, we don't have to, um, I think that could be helpful or at least, uh, you know, kind of add, add a little bit, you know, illuminate some of the things we're talking about here. This has all been abstract up to this point for the most part, outside mm -hmm. of murder mic or machete mic or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. But, but we can get into some of the specifics of what we mean. But if you were gonna think about some of the things the government does and think about it like that, like a job of the government is just one candidate. So we've talked about how just because there's a demand doesn't mean that, you know, there's always, that it's not necessarily a supply demand issue, right? Like sometimes there's always gonna be a demand. But so putting that to the side, if we're thinking about the government as one candidate to do a job in certain realms, like how, what are some realms that you think of that the government is doing and they are the dudes derping around with the shovels compared to someone who'd be really good at doing it? And what are, and maybe even what are some areas that you think the government is good at, at doing what it does and it is the best candidate for the job? And to put a fine point on it, how do we know? How could we know? And how could we know if we're wrong? You know, I finished uh, Scott Adams's book, Loser Think, a couple weeks ago. It was okay. I, I liked it. I probably need to go back through it. But one thing that he did say that stuck with me was he said, being right and being wrong feel exactly the same. And so mm -hmm. I think that's, that's a really uh, important point. And so, you know, the government, there are, there are probably some things that the government is actually really good at and is the best candidate for and that we would want to give credit to that as well. Um, and that we could be wrong about like, hey, I don't know if the government should be doing it, but, you know, we need to, we need to know how do we know Whenever we say, well, the government could be, should be doing this or shouldn't, how do we know? What criteria are we using um, yeah. to reach that conclusion? So that, I yeah. know, thoughts on that. Yeah, so, so uh, what I would say is like job. Job is what you should be doing. I have a job description. These are the items that I'm, I'm taking care of. This is what I do. Scope is what I can't do. The, the boundaries of which my job ends and someone else's job begins, right? 
So I think job and scope, although I do like the idea, if we did think about it more of a job, I think the, the, the psychology in our brain would actually operate in, in a more appropriate way is what I would say, where, um, you know, scope is what they ought not to do. If we sell it as a job, I think that's great. The problem is when you build that dependency on government in places we shouldn't, the job that is being interviewed for is boss, right? Like we are constantly interviewing the CEO and figuring out what direction do we go? You know, we're not interviewing the janitor. You know, if if we thought about it as interviewing the janitor, they have this very specific job, this very specific skill set, and we're going to hire based on that, you know, job description and skill set. If we thought about it like that, I think we would do already a million times better than what we're doing now. But we're always trying to figure out who's going to be the boss. And that's, that's the kind of psychology in our head I think we really need to break. And we can think about in those terms, that'll already help. Um, in terms of, so you're saying you know, what, narrow the narrow the criteria. Is that yeah. what you're saying? Like, well, understand the position you're interviewing for. Like, I I, I personally at my work, I interview other people, and if I kind of just went into a blind interview and I didn't even know a position they're interviewing for, like, what what do I do? I'm gonna make sure because this guy I might be interviewing for him to be my boss. It's like I'm I'm gonna be super strict and make sure this person can hit all the criteria to be the perfect employee to do everything. Yep. And, you know, if I know that I'm interviewing them to be another engineer, full disclosure, I'm an engineer, um, you know, I, I know what I'm selecting for. I know what I'm interviewing for. I know questions to ask. Um, you know, the, I mean, you see it in these presidential debates. Some of the questions are asked, like, what, what are you going to do in your first 100 days? Or, you know, it's not, it's not what are you going to do in your first 100 days. It's what are you going to change hmm. fundamentally, fundamentally in your first 100 days. And that's normally like, I'm going to get rid of poverty. I'm going to do all these things. Like, that doesn't, that, that's cancer. not in your job description. Cure Biden. Cure cancer. Actually. Yeah, oh, exactly. Oh, wow. Well, he knew cancer back in the day. And Sounds was, good, man. Anyways, um, uh, you know, but, but it's understanding the job description first and foremost. And, you know, I, I do think we can bring it to a, a scope type argument. Obviously, that's the, the way us conservatives normally frame it, but also it kind of fits in, in line with the negative rights narrative. I don't care what you can do. I just care what you can't do. I don't want you to do these things. And then if you go off and do stuff that does fit within your scope, whatever, you know, um, and, and kind of what you, you talk about before, it's like competency to me, I would rather have someone in the government who's not competent at all. That way, nothing gets done. But that's only because we did not define the job that they're supposed to do. If we actually had a clear defining job in, in a, a uh, you know, position that they're supposed to be in, then I want them to be super competent. But now it's like, to me, you know, every day that, you know, they, they say they shut down the government and Congress, you know, they're not speaking to each other because each other it's a government shutdown. To me, every day of a government shutdown is a great day. Because nothing gets done. Slash it, and it's slash awesome. it, slash it. Exactly, awesome. exactly. So, you know, that's, that's all I want to do is be in a constant state of government shutdown. But I do know after a certain amount of time, probably not going to be good. You know, it's probably not going to be good for us. Um, but, I mean, it's kind of like that uh, to bring it to, I don't know if anyone listening is a fan of The Office, but it's kind of the Michael Scott. It's like, you know, if babies were president, they would do all these things. And, you know, maybe – they would not be able to do anything. And maybe it's not a good idea to have a baby president because they're so incompetent <laughs> at that age. Like maybe you don't want them running the country because they have all these uh, powers to do. So uh, to bring it back to what, what they do good at, again, it's going to be the, the national defense. That's the easiest one to see because it's external. It's outside of our borders. So it makes it a bit easier to think about, you know, when it's not happening, you know, I'm not going to have the military barge into my house. Um, and, you know, I, I feel better about that, but they're out there protecting us, although they can, I think, go out of scope there when you're trying to overturn governments and stuff like that. We can get into that. But, you know, they, they overall do a pretty darn good job at, at that. What they don't do a good job at is, you know, providing the, these goods and services and to bring it to, I guess, maybe a, that administrative agency that, that does a good job, like we like them, but even their scope is starting to widen their job descriptions not hitting there. So if you go to like the FDA food and drug administration, great people, they care about what we put in our bodies. They want to make sure it's not unsafe. They want to make sure they approve all these drugs and, and fully vet them out to make sure that I'm not going to be putting something super harmful into my body. The way I always like to stay to phrase it and kind of, I always take a South park quote from this is like, what would happen if the FDA was gone tomorrow? We go from eating good food and taking good drugs to eating dirt and chairs. It's like, no, like people are, you got to understand that people, individuals are normally competent most of the time, not always perfect, but 
you know, I think we would be okay. And it doesn't mean that I just want to overthrow the FDA and take them out, but you can kind of reduce that, that, you know, FDA to a bit smaller because now it's so expensive to create these drugs because of all of the, the, uh, you know, paperwork, all of these companies have to go through just to get through the FDA. And now less people are creating drugs because they know it's not worth my time. It's not worth the money because only like 23% of companies who put drugs out there and get tested by the FDA even get approved or, you know, have the funds to keep it going. So now we can understand that, you know, maybe not all the best drugs are out there, not only because we want to make sure they're healthy for us, but because there's no, there's less and less incentive to create these things, you know, but the big companies can do it because, you know, they have the capital and it's nice for them because now they don't have to compete with the little companies. You have to have a lot of capital in order to do some of these things. So maybe that is something that we shouldn't get rid of. Obviously we don't get rid of the FDA completely, but certainly reduce the size. And let's, let's actually put a, a, a well-defined job description, you know, on the FDA's uh, job when we're, I guess, interviewing a new head or just generally, you know, kind of reforming some of these large government agencies to, to make sure they're doing what they're intended to do. And I know we're trying to get to what, sh- what, what should they be intended to do. Maybe that's a worthwhile thing for the government to do to make sure that they're, you know, we're not ingesting poison. Although I, I would argue that if, again, they're gone tomorrow, you know, if, if someone's getting uh, sick because they're they're eating food that wouldn't have been otherwise approved by the FDA while well, they can take legal action against, you know, that food company and that incentivizes them to self-regulate rather than having some centralized power to it. So there's always, you know, again, we, we see it now as alternative options because again, these government systems are already in place, but really should be the number one thing. And to kind of go to, you know, the, the kind of charity part of government, you know, we have charities that can help people who are in hunger. We have charities who can do a lot of different things. Normally they go through religion. I mean, Americans are profoundly charitable people on average. You know, we give a lot uh, to these private industry or private charities who can help others. And it's not that because I, I do think in a healthy society, we will have some sort of safety net for the people who are drug addicted or, you know, born with an illness that won't allow them to function and, and be able to kind of keep up with the rest of society, or at least just get a boost up, you know, if they, if they do well, find not themselves. Not those in the same category, but it, yeah. Yeah, it's okay. Keep going. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but even if we do have some sort of government safety net there, uh, it shouldn't be the first option. Like, you should want to go, you know, if I'm down on money, my first option should not be to go to the government to give me more money. My first option should be going to fa- to family and saying, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm having a rough time. You know, I just got out of college and I don't have any money, mom, dad, can I move back in with you for a little bit? You know, maybe pay a little bit and um, rent and until I can, you know, build myself back up and find a new job. It shouldn't be like government, give me this, you know, stop, stop getting that money that I can take for a little bit until I get back up on my feet. But now that did not incentivize me to get back up on my feet because there's no one yelling at me, which my parents are saying, get the heck out of my house. You know, that's a pretty good incentive to change your behavior in case your behavior is not in line with, with trying to, you know, make money to get out of the house. So it's not only that maybe we shouldn't have government do some of these things, but even if government does some of them, it shouldn't be our first resort to immediately go to a centralized power to solve our problems, at least incentivize some behavior to do it outside of government. And then for the, the worst, the, the, the people among us who just cannot do it themselves because of something that maybe they don't have full control of, I think in a healthy society, we do have some sort of safety net there. Um, I agree. I, I like that. I, incentives is a, I love economics. I know we've talked about Thomas Sowell before, you know, you quoted him earlier. And uh, I was thinking about the quote where, because you're talking about whenever you said scope is what they ought to be doing, what they shouldn't be doing, right? So if, again, going yeah. back to when you said janitor, um, if you hire a janitor and then, you know, three days later, you, you find them in the PO, in the HR department taking phone calls, like, what are you doing? <laughs> this is not what I hired you to do. And also, you're really bad at this. And that's why I didn't hire you to do it. So having that criteria is necessary. You know, Thomas Sowell, you know, one of his quotes is, anything can be labeled a success with sufficiently low criteria and anything can be labeled a failure with sufficiently high criteria. Um, And so a lot of this stuff, it's kind of the same way. If you don't, you know, if you aim at nothing, that's where you'll land. And so if you tell the government, just go and you don't have any criteria of what it should be doing and a feedback mechanism to be checking at how they're doing at what they're supposed to be doing, then you're just going to end up with that kind of like, well, I guess just do it and we'll just keep doing it. One thing I wrote down here that I think is interesting. So I, 
I would say actually it would be totally okay with the getting rid of the FDA completely. Um, okay. And there's a lot of organizations like that. And the reason why I would be okay with doing that, because I, there, again, that whole nuance thing, it's kind of a tricky subject, but there's a lot of things that I think were not just good, but necessary a hundred years ago that the government did or stepped into that that has is no longer a felt need um, mm -hmm. of the government. And so what I wrote down was government regulation is a sorting mechanism. It's that's what the FDA does. It's a, it, it's a sorting mechanism for people to say, oh, the FDA approved this so I can use it or I can consume it for myself. It's how they can sort between things that are sketchy and things that they feel are safe, right? Sorting mechanism is just information. So you use sorting mechanism in an absence of information. I need a sorting mechanism if I don't have information about anything else, right? That's, that's what, uh, I mean, that's another economic principle that you can apply to a high school diploma versus college uh, degree or undergrad versus a master's versus a PhD. Those are sorting mechanisms for employers to go, okay, I don't want someone with, a, with a high school diploma. I can sort all those people out. I really would rather not someone with just an undergrad. I can sort all those people out. And I'm really looking for a master's and above, right? And so you use those as a sorting mechanism because it's information. It's telling you information about that product in the case of an employer about that person and what, what they could provide to you, right? You could just look at every application but that would take a lot of time. So it's easier to have those sorting mechanisms. You could just buy any food all the time, but it's better to have that sorting mechanism, FDA. It's information. That's all it is. And so my, the thought that I had as you were talking about that is, I think that there's lots of sorting mechanisms that the government provides right now, the FDA being one of them, that makes sense when you live in an information vacuum, when you live in a, a time or a place when there's an absence of information to help you make a decision about what you want to do in that particular instance, right? And we don't live in an information vacuum. We live in a saturation of information. There's good information, there's bad information, but no one could say that we don't have information, right? And so the government really, what it does now is it operates as a sorting mechanism, but it's like a lazy man sorting mechanism. In other words, if the government just removed itself from a lot of these realms, people would be able to get that information. You could mm -hmm. do the homework yourself and get it. That's the, that's the beauty of the, of the internet, that and cat videos. Like that's what it does is it gives you information and you as the individual, you can make those decisions for yourself. Um, whereas a hundred years ago, you wouldn't be able to do that. You didn't have the information. So it's like, I need a sorting mechanism to help me with that. So th that's the thought that I had about some of those kind of government entities is that mm -hmm. regulation is just a sorting mechanism. A sorting mechanism is just information. Information is only necessary in the absence of information. So you could say <laughs> some of those sorting mechanisms aren't necessary today, but that's a different thing. So, well, if I could add to that real quick, yeah, go for it. it it's, and I want to keep praising, I'm, I'm sponsored by the free market apparently, but it's free market innovation. It's innovating us out of those needs of that centralized power to be that sort of mechanism. You know, right. I would say a hundred years ago, yeah, FDA, we needed it because someone got sick, they died. I mean, you, you might get the local newspaper, but it's not going to be on Twitter. No, you know, <laughs> exactly. It was off. I mean, maybe MySpace. I think that was a hundred years ago, but that's true. Um, but you know, I think if we innovate our ways way out of it, and and that's really the problem with all all of these uh, large government agencies or even these large government ideas when you get into like healthcare like we we think healthcare should be a human right everyone should have healthcare i feel awful when people don't have healthcare i feel awful when somebody goes bankrupt because they have all of these bills but the idea is to keep innovating at a rate that you know i anyone the poorest person can mri because we've innovated so far beyond the mri that even these technologies that are really good but now considered old will still be really effective and now super affordable for everyone who, you know, couldn't afford it previously. You know, to me, I always try to relate this kind of to the automotive industry when you have, you know, we could say automo the car started to be produced like in the 19 or the 1890s, 1880s, I forget. Um, but, you know, if the government would have said in 1880, there's this huge inequality of transportation, we're going to give every man, woman and child a horse and buggy. Like, great, they all have this free transportation, but would we have the automobile right now? 
because now the market incentive to create effective and efficient transportation is basically gone. So we need to make sure that you keep that free market incentive, even with the most, you know, obvious forms of government need kind of that, that, um, I guess, you know, I, I bring up national defense, like we want national defense. I think that's absolutely an obligation of the federal government. But if we were to just say, okay, only them in national defense, we don't have any private, we don't have Lockheed Martin or any of these other companies creating things for that national defense, but we only keep it in this public vacuum. Well, we're not going to become more efficient. We're just going to need these old, you know, we still might have the musket right now if we didn't allow the free market to at least come in and help in a market that we, we would argue that probably should remain public at this point, which is just national defense. So, you know, I think just keeping out the free market completely is always a bad idea, no matter what it is. Yep. And you always got to compare it to like what, what behavior we incentivize even by the producers by saying, we're going to keep this public government just does it better. Well, guess what? Government will do it better. And it's really hard to measure this. You know, we can't measure, you know, we start with the government solution here, you know, in 15 years, we can't compare unless we're comparing another country, what the free market solution provided compared to what the public option is there still. Right. And we kind of see this with, with healthcare. We see healthcare slowly getting better around the world. And I think it's because of free market healthcare systems, somewhat free market healthcare systems like ours that allow it to innovate and then give to those, those, you know, fixed markets. And we kind of allow them to use our innovation and we pay a high premium for it, but at least everyone around the world is starting to benefit. I think if, if the domino drops with the U S with the, the public healthcare, or at least demanding it with no free market option, you know, the whole world ends up suffering because now that innovation has just stopped. Totally. I, I agree. I think we're on the same page on a lot of that stuff. I think that, uh, yeah, it, it'd be interesting to, to dig into some of the specifics of like, okay, I'm a, cause in a sense, and what you're, when you're talking about the free market, that's just the exchange of labor for mo monetary compensation or otherwise. Right. And so, that's really so what I would say when you talk about explicitly monetary capital, you're, you're there. Uh, again, I always broaden free market to ideas. There's, there doesn't have to be any monetary capital involved. Right, it's right. a free exchange. That's it. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm talking uh, specifically about goods and services, not, not necessarily just mm -hmm. about ideas. Although I 100% agree, marketplace of ideas is a literal thing. Um, yeah. But I think it'd be interesting to, to think about like, okay, so taxes is me paying the government for a service. You know, I see uh, you know, I get, I have my own uh, beefs with conservatives and uh, progressives. And whenever I piss them both off on Twitter, I know it's a good day. But whenever people talk about stimulus checks and they say, well, that was my taxes in the first place. I paid for that and I should get it. Well, that, that's not accurate. But we do think about taxes as something that we're paying the government for, right? And so mm -hmm. like at my job, uh, I regulate, my employer pays me for a service and I regularly get a, an uh, employee evaluation. It's like every uh, couple months, something like that. We get employee evaluations. And then we check in how we're doing. They talk to the people around us. They look at our, you know, the outputs of our services. And they say, here's where you're doing well. Here are the things you can work on. How can we help you be better at this, right? And if I was awful, they would say, we're going to uh, fire you because you're really bad at these things. And then we're going to find someone who's better at these things than you are, right? But they have a mm -hmm. feedback mechanism. They've got a couple, but that's one of them that they use to determine if I remain the right person for that job, if I remain the right fit for providing that service. And what it, it seems to me, we don't have, like people say, well, that's what elections are, right? We're, we're deciding if we want this. No, elections, we don't elect policy every four to six years. We don't do that. We elect mm -hmm. politicians and hope they do something with policy. That's not the same thing. But we have these bureaucracies and these policies and these different government entities that are just doing stuff, and we don't have any feedback mechanisms for us as the consumer who's paying the taxes in to go, hey, how – how are you doing here? You know, like office space, right? It's like, what exactly is it you'd say you do here? Like, we don't have that. And so that's a problem. And if it, if we even had something like that and it came back, hey, no, they're the best. We're doing the best at this. Rock on, man. That's great. I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. But having no feedback mechanism whatsoever outside of like 
And I'm talking like baked into the cake, baked into the system. Like there are feedback mechanisms if some person wants to go, here's how inefficient this was this year. And it was the same last year. Actually, it was worse this year than last year. Next year will probably be worse. Like there's nothing baked into the system for that. But that's a, that's a whole nother thing. But I think that'd be something interesting to think about of, okay, you're a citizen, I'm the government, and I wanna pitch you on providing X service. And I have to sell you, you have to hire me. I mean, that's what a, that's what a job application is, right? Is they look and mm -hmm. go, okay, here, how, can, how, how have you shown that you can do this before, right? What are you, what's your credentials? What's your capabilities? Who are your references? And how does that stack up against all the other guys? And then I'm gonna pick based on that. And then I'm still, even if I'm happy with that decision in the moment, I'm still going to be constantly monitoring whether or not that was the right decision or if mm -hmm. I should replace you with someone who's better. So I think looking at some of the things the government does and then looking at alternative candidates, so to speak, within that would be a really interesting uh, topic of conversation in terms of getting into the specifics. We're at about an hour and 10, maybe hour and 15 now. I don't know if you want to cut it off here mm -hmm. and then we can do some of that later. It, I don't know if it's kismet uh coincidence or not but i also am out of whiskey so that could also mean something that's a problem um, so it's up to you but that's kind of where my my mind goes uh tell me what you tell me what you think yeah yeah um i think uh it would be good good uh spot to stop here again this is so broad i'm gonna use the word scope so broad in scope you can really go in a lot of different directions with this and and to unpack a lot of the the things we've talked about i, I think would be super useful because again nuance and everything we can stay non-nuanced and normally you can just get the policy there right but yeah. you know to, to jump into the nuances i think this would probably be a good place to start also my kids might be hungry um so i'm going to attend to them uh, eventually but a, a quick comment you know when it when it comes to that accountability or, or that kind of progress report you're talking about they provide it you know if you dig far enough there's i mean there are public services they kind of have to publish these things but they publish them in spots that you're not really gonna you really got to dig and then you got to analyze you know the the tools to analyze some of these outputs aren't the greatest and normally you got to rely on someone from the new york times to do it for you and then you got to rely on them to kind of give you the least biased answer you can get or the least biased analysis i trust them and yeah and and you know it's it's difficult i mean and to me to me it's like you know when they if you if you try to read a bill it's like three thousand pages long. it's moby dick you know it's this huge insane piece of literature that is mostly just just lawyer speak right and and i think this is part, part of the problem i know there's different people uh, i think like ben shapiro might have been one of the people who kind of uh said they should pass a bill that limits every bill to be passed to three pages long, 12 page or 12 size 12 font. So the average person can read it Comic because saying. they make it so, right. They make it so hard to read and so tedious that not the average American doesn't want to read this stuff. So we can hold people accountable if we all get the lawyer degree and we can kind of set aside 48 hours a week to read all the stuff that's happening. But you know, it's made super difficult and there's, there's ways we can do it. And, and again, in a free market where the information to the people would actually help you become a more efficient uh, machine in that market, you know, they're going to make it super easy. They're going to send out a tweet that's got all the, the metrics you need on there. They're going to be truthful if it helps them. Again, there's, there's some people who don't want to divulge all of, you know, their, their, uh, you know, production throughout the year, you know, if they don't look good, they don't want to give it. But if it, if it actually helps them become a better, machine like you think uh you know politicians would like to become a more efficient machine for the people as they say they are you know they they would make it super easy give it to the people like this they would make you know voting decisions based on that and it would become a lot easier but again not in the job description so maybe that's the problem i agree all right man uh i what i'll do is i'll stop the recording here uh, here in a second and then we can chat a little bit afterwards before you uh go feed your kids. Um, so what I will say is, yeah, I, I enjoyed the conversation. I think this is, that was interesting. I think there's a lot more to unpack there, especially getting into, because, you know, one of the problems is people live on low information diets, right? And so a lot of the yeah. stuff we talked about is kind of up here. And, it, and, and I'm not saying that like it's up here mentally, like it's, I'm not saying it's like non-tangible, but That's people the problem, know, I okay, I understand what you're saying, but now connect to that to my day-to-day -day experience. And if I live on a low information exactly. diet, it's like I want to care, but I need you to make it easy for me to understand what you're saying 
and how it impacts my life. Because that's what most people care about is how does this impact my life or not right. impact my life, right? Um, so I think that'd be interesting. Um, so Kevin is on engineeringpolitics.com. He has his website with all of his written content. He puts his podcast on there. You can also find him on YouTube, Engineering Politics. He's also on locals, locals.com slash engineering politics. You can follow him on Twitter at engineering politics. You might have uh, figured this out by now, but his every all of his tags are engineering politics. Although my understanding is that his uh, LinkedIn is my little pony fan uh, Goku twelve or is it twelve or thirteen? It's not Goku. It's Vegeta. Okay, but uh, I changed it a while back. There's some copyright infringement thing there, totally, so I did, totally I did make a change. So, but that's his LinkedIn. But I think the rest of it's all of its engineering politics. Absolutely worth checking out, especially. If you know you're someone like me, where I don't really know a lot about conservatism, I just you know just form my own ideas about what seems reasonable. You know, if you want, if you're looking for that perspective, I think it's a great place to go to. He lays all of this stuff out very clearly and super concise, um, very digestible. So I'd highly recommend you uh, check that out. If this is the kind of thing you're into, uh, I would ask you check my stuff out at Return to Reason. Follow me on Twitter at Mind Mundane Mind. Um, on Twitter, and then my locals is return to reason or locals.com slash to reason, YouTube, uh, return to reason, and uh, my uh, LinkedIn is uh, my little pony fan Pikachu 13. So there's some similarities there uh, as well. And so that's how that works. Kevin, did I hit all of the places where people can check out your content? Did I miss anything? So you got it. Uh, other than the maybe ThinkSpot, I don't know if you brought that up, and they Think might, spot, yeah, they, they had an spot. update where they might be out of beta. Yeah, uh, so that'd be cool. So if you head on over to ThinkSpot, there's lots of good stuff on there. I'm on there too, uh, but I don't ever advertise it because I suck at everything. So anyway, but check them out on ThinkSpot if you're on there as well. And uh, I appreciate it, man. This was a lot of fun. I'm excited to do it again, and I'm going to yeah, awesome recording right now. All right, peace. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this conversation, and if you did, please go to the Engineering Politics and Return to Reason Locals communities and provide your feedback. If we get a good response, maybe we will consider making this conversation experiment a regular podcast. And as I said at the beginning of the show, I want to take a quick moment to share some different ways you can help support this content. There are a few easy ways to do this. You can follow me on Twitter at ENG underscore politics. You can join the Facebook group named Engineering Politics, where I share and discuss content with the Facebook community. You can subscribe to my new video channel on YouTube under the channel name Engineering Politics, where I'm beginning to make videos using the podcast audio laid over different graphics to create a better overall podcast experience. I'm also active on ThinkSpot, which is the discourse generator application that promotes intelligent and honest conversations while discouraging the trolling and nonsense found on most social media platforms. And you can find all of my podcasts and videos there as well. But the best way to interact with me and get the latest content is to support this podcast using the Engineering Politics Locals community. I talked a bit about this at the beginning of this podcast, but this is an amazing community that goes far beyond just a membership platform intermediary for creators. It allows the followers of this content to get together and discuss the newest articles, podcasts, and videos in one place. It's also a great place to find other creators like Return to Reason. I strongly urge you to join the Engineering Politics Locals community at engineeringpolitics.locals.com. You can become a member for free, but I would love to have your support with your subscription so this content can remain independent and keep growing. Monthly subscriptions to the Engineering Politics Locals community start as low as $2 per month. I hope I can count on your support so I can start making higher quality podcasts and eventually live videos. I appreciate your consideration. Let's build a community together. Thanks again for listening. This is the Engineering Politics Podcast. None of the persons, podcasts, books, or other references other than engineering politics used in this work directly reflect my ideas and or personal beliefs, nor should they be held accountable for anything said during this podcast. Thank you for listening.